Welcome back, everyone. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jaya Balu, and uh, she is a vast chief information security officer. Um, Previously, she was CISO at uh, KPN, which is the largest telecoms carrier in the Netherlands. Before that, she was at Verizon, and before that at France Telecom. Um, Jaya is formally recognized within the uh, list of top 100 CISOs globally, and ranks around the top 100 security influencers worldwide. Uh, 2019, she was also selected as one of the 50 most inspiring women in the Netherlands uh, by Inspiring 50, uh, which is a nonprofit aimed to raise diversity in technology by making female role models and technology more visible. She has a wealth of industry experience in telecoms, plenty of time uh, spent educating and advising. So we're very fortunate to have Ms. Blue here with us today. Yeah. So, um, so I'm just gonna, I told Grant, I warned Grant actually, that I am just gonna go a little bit all over the place and kind of do the full keynote experience by let you letting you know what I think, what I'm afraid of, and we're going to zoom in and zoom out and talk about all the things. Um, uh, and I wanted to have like this top 20 list for you for the OWASP top 10, but I, yeah, I don't know if we'll get just there. Um, I think it's kind of clear now that we know uh, stuff is breaking, you know, and we know uh, if you would talk to any CISO, I saw the most wonderful thing on Twitter the other day where uh, there was someone working in security that was singing um, a sort of lamentation song from Les Mis about everything that's wrong to her CEO to try to get budget. Um, and of course, she wasn't getting it. So even though we know what's breaking, we're not really great at getting our comms sorted in order to be able to fix the problem. Um, and that really points out to the fact that we have this Cassandra complex. So. Some of you may know who Cassandra is. She was a figure uh, in mythology that basically uh, all kinds of horrible crap happened to her, but Cassandra knew the past, uh, but also was cursed in that she could predict the future, but nobody believed her. Um, and I feel like a lot of folks working today in security have the Cassandra complex. We all know what happened, all the hell we needed to live through to get where we are today. And we also kind of have an inkling about what's kind of coming up on the horizon the next couple of years if we don't change. But, you know, it's not really like people take everything that we're saying at face value and then implement the changes that we keep claiming that need to be made in order to fix the problem. So how do we kind of get over this? How do we, considering all of the things that are going on, how do we actually get to this place where we are clear about the problem, all of us are saying the same things, and that we can actually point to a sort of, I don't know, KPIs or something that actually points out how we can, you know, demonstrate the value of the propositions that we're suggesting in order to fix the problem. And also like, because there are so many different things to fix, because we need to anticipate on so many different scales, how do we actually figure out between the different opinions, how to get more signal through the noise? You know, where do we actually need to start focusing? How do we need to start examining the problem? Which things should we start and stop doing? These are the questions that I don't have all the answers to, but I certainly think deserve to be asked yet again. Um, and if we just kind of get started, um, the biggest thing I think in the last year has been our inexplicable almost rise of ransomware cases. And it's no longer a case of ransomware, or rep, but it's really like a sort of ransom when. Um, and it seems like, you know, there's, there's not enough happening where like we're still like using insecure passwords, old vulnerabilities all over the place, uh, no MFA, it, all kinds of things that we also hear kind of know better uh, how to do it, but uh, we see that we're not evolving quickly enough to be able to implement those things that we already know about, and criminals are way better uh, than the defenders in terms of adapting their stuff, and actually, like, they're iterating their own maturity levels, and we at Avast are seeing these criminals get more and more and more professional. They have call centers, they have, you know, they're selling their stuff as services, they have infrastructure as a service, they're providing entire networks that they manage efficiently, you know, behind multiple kind of proxies in order to get this all working at scale. Um, and then they are 
like really, you know, they're no longer trying to just make money by mining for the gold, but they figured out it's about the shovels and the wagons. So uh, providing this stuff as a service means that you're lowering the complexity, of course, for uh, any attacker to kind of gain entry into the game, but we've increased the complexity for the defenders to be able to find out what the hell is going on in their network because they have evolved so organically and orgasmically. And we see the kind of collateral damage from these types of attacks just also exponentially increasing. I'm not sure how many of you are fully familiar with the project uh, like No More Ransom, which was started uh, by the Dutch police together with um, Europol and uh, two competitors, um, Kaspersky and McAfee, um, not just our competitors, but competitors to each other, obviously, uh, who decided, you know, we need to work together if we really want to look at how do we uh, solve the problems. And we're very happy to be part of this ourselves. But where you actually go there first to look for decryption keys, or if you have a decryption key, in another case, that you go and give it to No More Ransom, these are the types of solutions that would inevitably like help us figure out how to delay that incredibly complex uh, obstacle of trying to fix all of our things endemically inherently to not have some of those insecure practices continue. We also need to take a deep breath and calm down because a lot of this is also leading uh, to an increase in geopolitical tensions because of the impact of some of these attacks, because of uh, the nation state actors that are either behind it or um, like Kim Jong, who's you know, made an estimated about uh, $2 billion uh, just by doing ransomware campaigns. This is according to a UN report. I mean, there's a clear nation states who are engaging in the ransomware and blurring the lines between cyber criminals and state actors. But there's also nation states, of course, like Russia, that is actually just contributing code uh, to ransomware operations and harboring uh, these criminals in order to allow this stuff to happen. So all of these things make us kind of anticipate a global response where in actually reality, what we really need is de-escalation and cooperation. Um, and going back to that global uh, problem, you know, we're not making it easy on ourselves either. We keep breaking stuff. And the things that we keep breaking are the kinds of collective security mechanisms that we've been trying to get globally in terms of protection for both security and privacy. So when you see um, states that cast a very long shadow across the internet in terms of their um, policy setting, the fact that there's an Australian act that will allow authorities not just to um, be able to uh, attack uh, you know, when necessary to do targeted operations, but also force cooperation of um, tech companies uh, to do so many additional things. These are things that I think we really need to kind of figure out how we nip them in the bud. The same thing, the idea that we would create splinter nets or separate economies where you have a sort of national code base, if you will, that doesn't intermingle with anything that's foreign because you're worried about some sort of um, uh, globally initiated supply chain tax. We're setting up our own barriers to success by doing this. So I really think that we need to think about how do we um, figure out what is actually equitable for a longer period of time and make sure that even though we see these global developments that we think locally about how to ensure that they're not happening in our own backyard and then try to influence those global conditions by moving every time from a local regional to global perspective on a lot of these things because they're really very uh, technical in nature. One example, when the COVID pandemic hit, we saw an exponential rise in spyware and stockware. And, you know, it's hard uh, to figure out who the heck is really behind it. Are these just small commercial companies or are we talking about total state actors? Uh, all we are seeing is the permissions that are asked by different pieces of software uh, on our user base. Um, and when you take a look, it's really, really difficult uh, to kind of differentiate what the heck is happening, why is it happening now, and what's different than before. And one of the worrisome trends that we see is that there's a sort of 
comparison between this line and the increase in domestic violence cases, because we see that this kind of stuff, when it's used at a more uh, individual level, is really coupled with this type of local abuse issue. And when you take a look at it at a larger uh, level and you zoom out again, you see that this type of excessive permissioning is also used by like COVID tracing apps, which were really like the Iranian uh, Corona tracing app, which was actually for us quite a shock because it was a state oriented uh, program, but pretty much to just track their citizens. So also here, you know, we need to really think about how on earth are we from an OS perspective, from a mobile device perspective, thinking about which permissions um, we would consider excessive and then uh, categorically ban them, uh, this kind of spyware from the app stores. And we really need to kind of think about, it, is this okay at a global scale, uh, starting at a local and national scale? Um, we also saw, of course, um, and I'm, I'm sure that in the security community, there's been um, an exhaustive uh, amount of attention paid to this. But, you know, I, I don't say this lightly that we should stop things. I'm not a big fan of, of censorship, but I do think that um, stamping out evil and not looking the other way is part of what we should be doing as a security community. And when we see that there are uh, campaigns running to target from oppressive regimes, uh, other countries, other nation states, and that they very often have this spillover effect to regular individuals and businesses and people who are journalists um, or uh, from an opposition party, that this is not something that we should be allowing free reign for. Um, and we really need to think about how many of these types of tools would we actually need uh, from any legitimate perspective. So, um, and to be fair, I mean, the Pegasus uh, software is not the only one of its kind. There's a lot of different types of spyware that would fall in this category that are still commercially sold today. And we need to think about a smarter regime, not just one that's policy-based, but also one that's technical to be able to both detect and block this type of activity. And whether that means signing the code or having a trusted code base that gets vetted and verified or automatically called out, uh, we need to figure that one out, but we really need to make sure that we detect it in the first place. What you also see is that our need for data isn't going anywhere. Um, and that everybody in any company that has ever claimed that data is the new oil uh, has to reckon with the fact that if that's the case, then data breaches are the new oil spill. They're messy, they're incredibly uh, hard to clean up. And the long-term effects of these data breaches is not something that I think is still as yet fully understood just because users don't always know contextually where exactly uh, that you know, password user combination was breached because they're not using unique password uh, username combinations that they uh, don't necessarily always, even if they are subscribed to a have I been pwned, then um, ubiquitously change everything that may have been compromised with that compromised set of credentials. Um, and they're not we're very good actually in making sure that there's um, that notice that's given to users is always uh, properly understood and then mitigated after that data breach has been exposed. So really, this kind of cleanup is something that's going to haunt us in the industry and with our user base for a very long time. Um, and I suppose that it's part of the entire trauma of the types of attacks that we're facing that cleaning up and recovering from them is incredibly difficult. I also think that um, we don't always understand how very large complex scale attacks start from very humble origins. Let's take solar winds. Part of the you know worry that we had is yes, we have a backdoored um, software application that's used by a very large uh, population, and that backdoored complex attack that was engineered um, by Russia. That that was well, attribution is a shit show, but you know we assume it's engineered by Russia, but that was um, a foundational problem that was so complex that it was not easily um, solved, but that's not true. 
And we saw after subsequent analysis that there wasn't just, uh, for the companies that were actually impacted by this, there wasn't just use of the back door, but there were also here again, you know, spraying of praying of passwords, uh, guessing passwords. Um, there were also easy mitigation mechanisms that could have prevented anyone who did have the backdoor software from actually executing any kind of evil. Because even if you got the update, you didn't have to have that server communicating back out to the internet. So if you had appropriate firewall rules, you could have prevented that from happening as well. So really here, it's um, thinking again about the basics you know, how are we protecting our networks from a very foundational uh, segmentation, hardening and uh, updating perspective and making sure that we have, you know, secure credentials and good authentication practice and the usual stuff. So we really need to figure out why is it that these advanced attacks are starting from these humble origins and how do we get better at fixing that? Well, you know, there was this great saying, I think it was, uh, I'm not sure, I think it was at the Bush election campaign. This is an age test, um, but uh, it was, you know, it's the economy stupid. And um, it's always about the economy, just like it's always been about the supply chain. And really it's always been about supply chain interdependency. Uh, the fact that we're looking extensively at supply chain attacks now is is good, but the problem's been there for a really long time, and we've been warning about it for a really long time. Uh, bottom line is we all use the same stuff all over the uh, world. It's not a great reason, though, to try to make your own thing, just like it's not a great idea to cook your own crypto because you're afraid that everybody's using the same crypto. But some things are better with the Karakoff principle that you think that it's out there and it's better to get attacked and that you know about the vulnerabilities and you make an iterative improvement every time. But when it comes to the supply chain stuff, you know, we have been seeing supply chain attacks. What we need to understand is a better uh, lay of the land, if you will, in terms of what is the different code bases. I have to think back to a, an anecdote. Um, I was CISO at KPN when we had Heartbleed. And our biggest problem when Heartbleed uh, happened was actually being able to identify in which vendor products the insecure uh, cell libraries were actually located. We didn't know. And when we called the vendors, they didn't know. So we weren't sure whether we could keep our VPNs up and running because our vendors didn't know of the products that we were, we were you know, creating the VPN service out of didn't know whether they were susceptible to Heartbleed. Now, it took, a, I think it was a 24 hour iteration before we managed to figure that out ourselves without their help um, and another 48 hours before we had a patch. But still, this is stuff that, you know, if you make something, you need to know what you put in there in order to understand if a vulnerability has impact on your product. Because if you don't do that as a creator of something, there is no way down the food chain that somebody else will be able to figure that out because everyone is part of someone else's supply chain, upstream or downstream. So we need to do a better job of the part of that supply chain that we control, either as a hardware vendor or a software vendor or a creator of a service, we really need to understand that because if we don't do that, we can't work on the bigger problem of supply chain interdependencies. And this is a huge problem when it comes to critical infrastructure. So if you have, uh, if you are a critical infrastructure provider, what you want to kind of know is within your sector that you're not all relying on that same tiny component in every single uh, piece of architecture. Because if you are, chances are high that you know you get one, you actually have some sort of nationally disruptive uh, scenario, and then all hell breaks loose, and then you've got regulators dictating which software and hardware you're going to use. So in order to avoid more drama, we need to figure out what the hell is happening on supply chain how is it constructed within our sector? And how do we have a better uh, understanding of underlying software components? And here, you know, I'm a big fan of open source, but here, as well as in proprietary, it comes down to the same foundational basics. You need to understand what it is you're putting in your networks, just like you would want to understand if you put uh, an ingredient list of weird stuff in your body, you really need to do this better. So, 
for that effort, uh, I want to already say thank you, Alan Friedman, um, who moved over from NTIA to CISA, and you saw a cybersecurity uh, SBOM that's going to be started. I think it's super important that we actually make a software bill of materials for those products that we are super reliant on, especially when it comes to the really important stuff, especially when it comes to critical infrastructure providers or folks that are reliant on them or folks that are providing to them. You need to be able to do this in order to have any like long-term future of supply chain assurance. And everything else is kind of meaningless unless we understand the foundational ingredients. And let me be honest, we're nowhere near getting to a place where we're gonna say that we're done soon. We're still trying to figure out naming conventions, how do we identify these components? So we're still kind of at the beginning. This is good thing because we can also then now determine how we actually get it right. The bigger the community that starts off trying to think about these problems, the greater the chance that that outcome will succeed. So heterogeneity now is good. Uh, let's make sure we, we keep that up. And that, I guess it's gonna mean that what we're gonna see because we're doing it in this fashion is that it's going to be an evolution not a revolution and that today it's still like pretty much you know party like it's 1999 in terms of vendor stuff and vendor bugs and everything else and you know um the shift is still yet to happen where we shift the burden of proof from the vendor or rather from the user to the vendor because right now when we take a look at all of the things that we buy and consume the burden of proof is on the user. You have to update your stuff, upgrade it when you can, buy a new thing. You know, you have to make sure that you have all of your stuff installed, that you know what's running on your blah, 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 blah. And I'm not saying that that is not the case. I'm not saying that you shouldn't take a, a bit of the responsibility. I'm just saying that right now, the way that we've architected it, there is very little responsibility placed at the door of the vendor. And I'd like to see more happen in terms of hardware and software vendors taking that responsibility. I'm a, a software vendor CISO myself, and I really believe that that sh responsibility should be born at the origin of the problem rather than at the uh, last leg, last mile of who you sell it to. Um, and I think we also need to figure out that this is not a problem that's going away anytime soon because you know, all of this stuff uh, is going to be based on this idea that uh, all of this software and hardware is going to require more and more user interaction, more and more telemetry gathering. Um, and that's going to happen to all of the products in our home. It's going to happen to the things in our workplace. This is the evolution and it will not be possible to turn this, you know, back or put the genie back in the bottle. So we really need to figure out if this is a uh, shift to the vendor. How do we protect all of that user data that is going to be gathered from all of these disparate places and communicate uh, with each other? How do we figure this out and make sure that the current legislation, which favors the strong, which favors the vendor, actually is also capable of, in the future, favoring current population of the vulnerable, the users? Um, and, you know, like the vulnerable are not just every user, but what we see also at Avast is that the older the user is, that the more disenfranchised and afraid they feel of using all of this technology, whether it's software or hardware or whatever. They're more worried about using the internet, about you know their uh, machines, everything. Um, and that this is getting worse every year that we've done our study. Um, there is a call, of course, in Europe to try to get longer lifetime of support for both software and hardware. Germany is asking, you know, telephone manufacturers to go a full seven years of giving security updates and also parts for um, mobile equipment. But this has yet to be adopted because the EU is not asking for seven years as of yet. And, you know, it's, it needs to compile through the rest of this ecosystem, if you will, uh, in order for it to really have impact. So a couple of things in the mix without making the others also follow suit doesn't really mean change for that vulnerable population. So the legislation needs to think about the weak as we go down the line. Um, indications are, are good, but, you know, lobbies are strong. Um, and if we really want to see the change, I hope that the community can help make a positive difference here. Okay. I'm talking to you about stuff that you guys think are kind of, you know, bread and butter. We know about this stuff. 
But um, I'm worried about stuff that we kind of see hitting us, but that we don't want to fully acknowledge because it's not kind of urgent and bleeding and like guts all over the place. And that's something that I think we're not that great at doing in our industry, uh, but also on our planet. Um, we need to be able to better prioritize important things before they become urgent, bleeding, you know, coronary heart patients on the table. Um, and one of those things is preparing for the eventual arrival of a quantum computer. Um, so I see things happening. Um, I, I work in this uh, project called the European flagship. I'm the vice chair and I see developments happening that make me realize that, you know, that time is getting closer and closer. That window is shortening rather rapidly um, in terms of what we need to do to get ourselves prepped. And part of that is, you know, trying to figure out how we come together. But the other half of that is just pure awareness, just everybody understanding what the problem is. So let me just do a little bit of that, explaining what the problem is. All of our current cryptography relies now on two difficult math problems. That is integer factorization and discrete log. Integer factorization, if you'll remember from high school, is basically taking uh, a large number and then separating it to its individual component parts. Um, it's hard to do. It's basically reversing a one-way function. A one-way function is something that's easy to do in one direction, but difficult to do in the other. So if I asked you what is 32 times 27, you might say, oh, it's 864. But if I give you 864, it's not always easy to say the factors of 864 that led you to get there are 32 and 27, which is also comprised of 4, 8, 3, and 9, which is also comprised of. And so to list all these individual factors is harder to get than just the simple multiplication that led you there in the first place. And um, there is a guy named Peter Shore who basically figured out how to do this reversal um, for the integer factorization. And then we have uh, Grover, who also, not that Grover, another Grover, <laughs> who figured out how to, uh, you know, try multiple potential opportunities at the same time in order to arrive at a sort of optimization of the function and get the answer quicker. Um, and both of these combined actually will rend our current cryptographic algorithms that we use um, weak by the time that there is a quantum computer that's able to run uh, Shor's algorithm. So uh, we also have this fundamental issue of everything that we've ever transmitted has potentially been captured. And when there is a quantum computer that is available, it'll be able to decrypt that uh, and then still render our secrets, our old ones, albeit moot, because you know there's predictive force of old secrets sometimes being just as good as new ones, because you kind of know, hey, this is the size of the uh, launch code uh, key or something else. So I really think it's important that we understand that a lot of the stuff that we've already transmitted that may have been cryptographically secured is already at risk. We need to make sure that we start now playing with this stuff in order to figure out how we prevent future risks from happening. And, you know, to go back, of course, we cannot do this in isolation. We cannot apply good crypto or new crypto unless we fix those basics that I was talking about a few minutes ago. So without having secure hardware, damn good operating systems, really like re-examining that protocol stew that we've created over the decades, and then still coding securely and having secure applications, only when we've got all that foundational stuff, can we apply good new crypto and hope still, you know, that it will work even with a reasonably advanced, well-funded attack because they're not gonna attack the crypto, they're gonna attack one of the weaker layers underneath. So we still need to get all of that stuff right, even when we wanna apply our crypto. That you know is a basic, but it's not optional. We can't just jump to the crypto and ignore all the other stuff. So I'm not suggesting that. I'm just suggesting that we don't forget this problem in light of the volume of work that we already have on our plate. 
So if you take a look at, you know, when it's going to happen, well, it's going to happen when we have a quantum computer that's big enough to take a problem that would take, you know, like kind of lifetime of universe uh, to fit, to calculate down to a couple of seconds. So uh, that depends on, you know, the size of the qubits we've got on our quantum systems uh, and when uh, someone actually like will make it available. Uh, to an adversary, that's when we've got an issue. But to kind of bring it back down to impact, uh, pretty much, you know, everything we have now is somehow impacted. Um, we have things like RSA that are just no longer secure, and we've got a real problem. But we also know that, you know, uh, even things like AES, that you still need to have a larger key size. You need to use the full 256 bits if you want to do this. And there still may be some issues with um, key exchange. So you still will have to think about additional uh, factors, even when using AES. And in order to figure out, well, how the hell, how bad is it? I, I always like to say, you know, and this is not the first time I'm saying this, but I'm saying this because I think I need to say this as often as possible, that we need to first figure out how long do we need to to keep our cryptography secure. Uh, if we have a requirement to keep something safe and secure for a decade or two, well, we already have a problem uh, because you know we think that it's gonna take about a decade before we have a viable quantum computer that breaks our secrets. Now think about some of the genetic data that we have. Think about some of the health data we have. If we just say health data, we wanna protect for the lifetime of the persons whose health data it is, we already don't know how to do that. And if you think about how we then need to transition, we're not great at transitioning to new uh, algorithms or new quantum safe systems, because like, take the example of protocols that we know that we need, you know, we ran out of IPv4 addresses a long time ago. I don't see us all using IPv6. It's going to take a while. We're not good at change, especially not globally. I mean, we also know about mobile algorithms that are still completely broken and can have like real-time decryption over the year. And even those things we don't change all over the planet. So we've got to kind of work now in order to be ready, even, you know, if it's if, it, if the quantum computer is available to an adversary just before it's ubiquitously available, we kind of have to start now. So it would make sense uh, for all of us to kind of take this seriously. So what do we need to do? We need to kind of look at first and foremost, you know, NSA had the sweet B advice uh, for everyone who is delivering to the government of increasing the key length of your current crypto. This is not too hard. We should all be able to do this. We should be able to look at what's the crypto we use and increase the key length. The second thing is, you know, there's all different types of technologies. One of them is called quantum key distribution. It's not like something that can be used everywhere because it's got a lot of limitations. Uh, and I'll explain those in a minute. And then thirdly, like look at those new set of algorithms that are also gonna be standardized by NIST in the not too near future, uh, or in the near future, I should say. And um, if we take a look at what the hell is this QKD thing? Well, it's it's really kind of uh, simple. Alice wants to talk to Bob. They're our friends. We know Alice and Bob. And what they basically do is they have a sort of fiber optic channel in between them and they relay uh, some key material uh, actually already, like, a, well, not really key material, but some configuration material over a public classic authenticated channel. And then they can submit their key material over this secure quantum channel and prevent Eve, the eavesdropper, from listening in because the attempt of Eve to try to figure out what's happening there would actually disrupt that quantum channel in the first place. Eve would cause the noise to kind of break the, uh, the signal. So how that really works is basically um, a set of polarizers uh, and the configuration of the polarizer is which Alice tells to Bob. So Bob, Alice says, hey, I'm gonna set up my uh, polarizers a certain way so that when that, a single particle of light, a single photon emitter, goes through it, um, it will go through those polarizers because I configured them correctly. If you configure them correctly, you'll also receive uh, that photon in the right way. So Alice then you know, sets this up, tells Bob about it, and uh, then Alice and Bob have a secure communications channel. That's all QKD here is establishing. There are limitations because this is all happening over fiber. Fiber has distance limitations. So this is not great for the scale of the internet. In order for this to work, you need something called MDI QKD, which is um, basically something that will extend the distance of the QKD solution by having a like a trusted node in between 
Alice and Bob. There's also a uh, potential for creating repeaters it, between um, this, this distance limitation in order to have this kind of bounced all over the place. Um, where the ultimate goal here, regardless of how you get there, whether this is all fiber connections or there might be some space bait nodes or quantum repeaters or other trusted nodes or using quantum memory, regardless of how we get there, this idea is to have this new foundational layer, which is not to be confused with the classical internet, but a sort of quantum internet, a sort of transmission layer, um, which can be used to have a secure network architecture. Again, this does not replace the internet. It is a layer. Uh, so I, I just want to be very clear about that. And a lot of this will also be used to connect quantum computers to each other. So it'll be fully quantum end to end. Um, and again, we're not all getting quantum computers as your new workstation. So this has very specific scientific applications that are going to expand once the use cases do. Um, but when it comes to post-quantum cryptography, the hardest part, it's the same hard part that we have when we try to do vulnerability management. It's trying to figure out what the hell do I have in terms of assets? So here we've got to also start with what are my cryptographic assets? Where do we use cryptography as a company, as a service? And you know, try to figure out what do I have now? What do I need to transition to? And what's the timeline in between? You also need to think about if you choose something that you need to transition to, assume that the first bake of that is not gonna work, that it's gonna break or that the algorithm is gonna suck or there's gonna be like another mathematical breaking of it. So that you need to think about the name of the game is crypto agility. Um, we like agile for lots of reasons, but pretty much because it's got a Darwinistic approach that you know only those that can change will survive. And that's definitely true here. So if you look for crypto agility and opportunities to do that, then you can say that even when there is a side channel attack, an incorrect vendor implementation, a weak algorithm that's proven uh, to be weak, um, you will be able to swap it for something else that will still work. Uh, and make sure now that you're already thinking about that, you know, policy framework that you want to have for innovation areas where you know you're going to need strong cryptography in the future. And already now, make sure that that supply chain has got your back by engaging with those software and hardware vendors and put it in your supplier security annex. Try it out and start failing and screwing it all up earlier. I'll let the police car drown me out. Um, what I also should tell you is there's a whole bunch of uh, applications that are already, you know, uh, creating applications for all of this quantum stuff. If you uh, want to try it out, there's a whole bunch of online resources for you from major companies like IBM uh, and Microsoft. There's all stuff that allows you access now. A lot of it is based on Python. So in terms of a coding perspective, it should totally be uh, doable. And there's different applications of your expertise that will let you build things for secure communications, which we just talked about, or even uh, different applications like quantum sensors or, you know, working on quantum computing applications on the IBM uh, quantum cloud uh, machine. So there's a lot of stuff to play with. I just would like to encourage you all to get your feet wet and play because it will make a difference. So zooming back out a bit. When I tell you about all of this stuff and all of the work that we still have to do, I think there is something that is pretty clear. We are just a little bit broken um, across our space uh, from where we started like building our networks and our systems originally. But you know, I, I really like this thing that I um, saw the first time in Japan called Kintsuge. And it's this idea that broken things have a certain amount of beauty and they can be fixed sometimes better than they were before. So it's an opportunity to be optimistic and not pessimistic about all of the stuff that we still have to do. So if we apply this like Kintsugi principle, then you know I, I think it, that opportunity means that like we look at it and zoom out again, there's three things that we all kind of need to do. First thing that we need to do is agree on what is it that we need to fix also within a company. So every company on earth 
kinds of needs these three things. They need to understand what the hell is the problem and how do I fix it and specifically look at themselves as a company and then also look at the roles of the people that are in that company and think about an approach to security that includes that individuality of the company and of the roles and really has a sort of custom tailored approach for examining security from that perspective. If we did that, then we need to be able to see how it's going with visibility and risk intelligence. We need to be able to see all of the stuff. You know, everyone who's ever dealt with an incident will tell you, God, I wish I had those logs or I wish I could see that part of the network or how come I didn't install that in my cloud instance and I do have it on my on-prem stuff. So visibility is super important, but even more important than just being able to see all the things is to be able to make a choice about what's important. And right now, very often, we tend to drown in a lot of noise and a lot of data in our seams and our socks. It's a bit of a mess. So really making appropriate distinction and, you know, MITRE attack is a great place to start for all of that stuff. And then writing custom detections based on MITRE, awesome sauce. So really thinking about how do we get that visibility and risk intel model put through our uh, security teams and our uh, tools is super important. And then finally, if we've got that, if we know what we need to fix from like a human perspective and a organization perspective, and we know how it's going from a, a sort of visibility perspective and a risk perspective, then we need to be able to act. And that means investing in the entire bloody company, not just a couple of security folk, but investing in the entire company that they have the appropriate security capabilities in place. So awareness, visibility and risk intel, security capability. We know what this is. We just need to kind of figure out how to translate that into a sort of plan. And, you know, I love that saying, those who uh, fail to plan, plan to fail. So I try to make a strategy plan for like three years and then kind of wheedle it down every year. So we got these three things, right? So we know what's up and what's broken and what we need to do. We know uh, what's going on and we can anticipate that globally. Then we can have plans for three years to kind of fix stuff. Woohoo! So I'm just showing you a sample of a plan that I made. And um, we need to then think about how do we get this further, right? And I, yes, I put in AI for security operations because I do think we need it because dying in all that data, we need to be able to make smarter choices. And what I did is I got, I always get inspired by, by OWASP and I'm always loving the top 10. So what I did, every year of the three-year plan is I made a top 10. So if this is the big chunky blobs of work, then let's split it to what are the must-haves for every year. And you know what? An organization, even a security organization can digest 10 things to do. We can't digest a hundred things to do, but 10 things we can just kind of barely get there. And even then you need to retain focus and still figure it out. But uh, and still make sure that the motivation is clear and change stuff if it's not working, it's fine. But, you know, having a top 10 makes things accomplishable also in terms of budget and appetite and focus of your IT organization and the rest of your company. Also really important, security is very often seen as the pain in the ass, expensive, bullshitty thing that I need to do because of some compliance jerk making me do it. It's rarely the thing that shows you the value of what it's bringing to the enterprise. And what we tried to do when I was still over at KPN, and I'm borrowing this from my work when I was there, was we tried to make a dashboard where you could see, and this is just one dashboard. I had one for every single team where we did something called the FOSI, and the FOSI number is potential harm of security incidents that left unchecked would have meant an exposure to the business. It's just money. It's a number of money. And we did this like financial figure on every single one of our things. It took about 30 seconds, by the way, just so we're clear. It's an estimation, which was approved by finance about how we calculate the risk per incident, per vulnerability. And we'd make sure that the red team had it for all the vulnerabilities. And we made sure that we could have a sum, lump sum on it for the stuff that we found in other places. And then we made sure we had it for all of the incidents. So before a ticket was closed, we calculated this FOSI number. It's all available online. It's all open source. You can get the KPN app. Uh, it's also available open source. So just in the app store, no permissions required. Um, and we just tried to make it financially understandable. So you got this idea of not being on this 
stupid roller coaster that we're always on. It's the information security industry where you wait for a breach to happen. You ride the roller coaster up because you're getting all this attention and budget and people want to give you FTEs and awesome sauce. And then you ride it until you get to a certain plateau when people are like, wait a minute, you have a lot of FTE and a lot of budget. And hmm, I don't know, I've got other priorities now because I need this time to market crazy application that's going to beat the you know socks off the competitors so then you lose you start going down the bloody roller coaster and you have to wait for the next hack to kind of ride up again that's a pain in the butt if you consistently demonstrate your value you don't have to ride it down so we need to get off the roller coaster uh, less drama and get on to a sustainable way to fix the problems that we already know about that's not just organizationally or locally or nationally, that's also internationally. The fact of the matter is, no matter how well we do our jobs, especially if we work in any type of critical infra or a company that is of fundamental importance in that supply chain, you know, someone's going to be trying to plot against you uh, from a zero day perspective or um, use you to uh, be able to compromise your customers or others. Um, so it's really important to think about what kind of rules of engagement do we want to be a part of. You know, there's the Talon manual that specifically says don't attack civilian targets. It's talking about like sort of Geneva Convention um, for uh, what we do. But I think that we need to think about this even broader. And there are opportunities now to engage. So we know that Russia wants to have a new uh, United Nations cybercrime resolution. This is a cause for concern. And we need to engage now with our different groups that we're all a member of, whether it's the Cyber Threat Alliance or the Cyber Tech Accord or somewhere else that you and your organization are a part of. Engage now to make sure that we are you know, trying our best to set those rules of engagement about what is okay and not okay to attack from an espionage or another type of perspective and make it clear that you know, there are certain things that must always be respected. And about that, um, I really believe in this idea, and that's I think foundational also to OWASP, that you need to get you know 80% of the benefit by doing 20% of the effort. And we need to kind of have that consistently across the board. That is really about getting the basics right. If we get the basics right, those simple things that we can do will stop those advanced attacks. They will stop the majority of them in any case. Of course, there will be a, a dedicated adversary that will invest in a zero day, but that is not the majority. When we take a look at the types of attacks that we're seeing at Avast, um, you know, there are, of course, there's every once in a while uh, really cool stuff. Like we're, we saw a DLL side loading attack happening in Southeast Asia. Uh, which I have to tell you from my threat intel team was just awesome um, that they found this kind of stuff. But it's also about the fact that we're still seeing compromised creds being used. We're still seeing like really silly things, phishing, and they don't need to be there. Vulnerabilities being exploited, they don't need to be there. So we need to get better at fixing our simple stuff. And we also need to get better at thinking about how we organize. Also here, you know, I am always inspired by the country of Israel. Um, who has a 911 number for reporting vulnerabilities. Like, wouldn't it be awesome if we all had a 911 number to report for vulnerabilities and someone actually understood what you were saying? You know, there is no internet police, but thinking about having this place where you just limit the potential of the adversary to do attack by having a better defense, this is the way we need to go. We also need to make sure that the adversary doesn't have an opportunity that's presented to them by our own governments. So any attempts to weaken cryptography or make it slightly uh, less strong than it is, is actually causing a bigger problem for all of us. So we absolutely need to be on top of that to make sure it doesn't happen. I know that we are always using the uh, arguments of pedophiles and terrorists in order to do these kinds of things, but really targeted operations would be my preference. I mean, also not great, but better than weakening cryptography for all of us. Um, you know, so absolutely no ghost proposal uh, kind of schema. Um, and then finally, like we need to make sure that like the NIS2, the Network and Information Security Directive that's coming out of the EU does include that wider scope, is actually able to have some teeth and does make sure that the entire ecosystem is protected through that supply chain rather than just 
parts of it, which are consuming at the tail end of whatever it is that you know, we need on the internet. Finally, in order to get to our secure future, we need to make sure that we're not launching the grenades of cyber warfare. So all these calls that have happened since SolarWinds and Kaseya in order to do any type of hacking back is complete bullshit. We should call it out, explain why it doesn't work, because after all, we really understand why hacking each other over the internet makes absolutely no sense. And we should not like allow these kinds of regimes to be supported by our own governments. Um, and of course, you know, we need to figure out a way to have a harmonized global economy and uh, have this maintenance of strategic cooperation. And how do we actually figure out how to use products all over the planet? Yes, but this, you know, walk softly and carry a big cyber stick and then smack everyone every once in a while is not the way to go. Finally, it's up to us. So I'd like you to take whichever part you can play and play it. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, you did tell me before the session that you were gonna be all over the show with all of the things, um, but I think you hit on a lot of things that I've heard a lot of conversations about uh, this week at Money 2020. Um, it's, it's a lot of things that, that a lot of the financial sector are very concerned about. Um, it's, it's stuff that is really playing on the minds of, of people in, in positions like your own, like CISO. Um, we got a, a couple of questions in, so I'm going to go through them quickly. We've got a couple of minutes. Um, so probably from somebody who's reading your full Avast bio, um, asked, do you think the rising global inequity is driving an increase in cybercrime? Hell yes. So if you take a look, um, I think it was just last week or this week where uh, there are more Chinese users online right now than Americans. And if you take a look at the total uh, population distribution in percentages, you know, Americans are the most connected um, in terms of having access to the Internet. China is actually not the most. But in absolute numbers, they just exceeded the U.S. population in total numbers. So from a population distribution perspective, the U.S. is leading. From an absolute numbers, China is leading. And so the next billion users of the Internet are all coming from, you know, Asia, all of them. So it's insane. But if you took a take a look, you know, globally, like, who do you think is on the bottom of the list in terms of Internet access? It's not a big surprise. It's North Korea. And that's in terms of population distribution it kind of makes sense, but also Africa. So I really applaud, I, I know I shouldn't, but I really applaud, I love Starlink. I love this idea of Elon Musk to give access to those that are the least connected. And you know, the ability to have these VSAT terminals or whatever kind of small satellite terminals to have this connectivity is gonna be a huge advantage because there is the potential to leapfrog, you know, kind of like going from 2G directly to 6G kind of thing, if we, if you could. And there still is going to be a requirement for some terrestrial connectivity, right? But this, yeah. this approach to get One World or Starlink connectivity to Africa and parts of South America, that's going to be a game changer. Well, I, I'm, I'm from South Africa originally, and, and I can tell you that at least with home internet connections, we, we went from uh, dial-up on telephones to fire it to the house, right? Because yeah. we didn't have the infrastructure in place for that intermediate stage and it was literally just leapfrogged. Um, but it does take an investment. It's a huge amount of time and effort and money. I worked in Namibia. We um, we built this this network that was, mm -hmm. that actually did the same thing. It went from copper to fiber. Yeah, exactly. Um, you're getting a lot of uh, uh, comments on, on the vendor responsibility and the SBOM in, in the chat. Um, and I'll let you pick up on a lot of those. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of traction in the channel there. Uh, but as a vendor that offers software, and not just any software, it's security software, um, how do you at Avast provide your SBOM? To whom do you provide it? And under what circumstances? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I, these are really good questions. And I actually don't have the answers to all of them. So I think that the, this is the kind of work that we need to start doing. And we don't, we're mm -hmm. at the phase where we're still trying to define how do you name the components in your SBOM? You know, it's just the naming convention. So how do we mm -hmm. determine? 
what the names are. So I think we're really early days in terms of understanding the full process of who we provided to. I do think though, that there's a foundational aspect that if you are a customer is a consumer, you know, and that's the deal, like Avast is providing a consumer service. Mm -hmm. So if your customer is the consumer, just like the early days of when we had like uh, privacy policies online, they were indecipherable. No one could read anyone's privacy policy. So you need to take your SBOM. It still needs to be there and it's a full content, but you need to make it understandable what type of risk it poses to users, specifically when you have known vulnerabilities in components. What's the point of SBOM, right? It's only so that you know when shit hits fan, which part of shit you are responsible for. Well, so that that um, I, I didn't know whether I should bring it up or not, but I'm going to anyway. Um, there are a, a lot of companies now, uh, security software companies, uh, AppSec software companies that will provide S bombs out of their out of their tooling. Um, and I'm going to mention Contrast here because Jeff has been pushing for the you know the food label S bomb forever. Um, it's it's becoming a thing that a lot more people are talking about. It's it's much more understandable. It's easy to read. It is easier to consume. It possibly doesn't have the depth of data that the FDA was asking for, um, but you know we'll, we'll we'll get there down the line, right? Yeah, um, I think you need both. Grant, uh, let me be clear. I don't think it's optional. I think you need both, and yeah. I think it's this is about your ability to consume. Exactly. So it's not about either or. It's about both. Absolutely. And of course, there is a Cyclone DX, which uh, is an OWASP project. You should take a look at that if you're still new to working on SBOMs. Take a look at what they're doing and how, how they, their tool provides options. So maybe it'll help it. Uh, naming things is one of the hard uh, things to do in, in development. So, uh, you know, we understand that that's the problem. I just want to do one quick call out because I know you're sure. going to forget. I'm so loving this project that you've worked on, Cornucopia. I just want to thank you for working on it because I think it's awesome sauce. I cannot wait to get everyone to play. So thank you. Cool. And I'll tell Toby that you're liking it. And uh, we'll, we'll... <laughs> thank you so much. And with that, I think we hand back to, to the organizers. Thank you thank so you, much. We really appreciate your time. And please do take a look in the channel. There will be more questions. I'm sure there are lots of people that want to talk to you about, about what you're Thank you so much. It was on. an honor. It was an yeah. honor. Thank you.